Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald at the Research and Collection Center of the Illinois State Museum in Springfield in the Geology Wet Lab where if you can see over my shoulders, you'll see there are a couple of newer machines, acquisitions of the museum here that are 3D printers. And what they're doing is helping scientists create models of real specimens. These can be used in education or they can be used to, to send to other scientists uh, for comparison purposes. And if you've never seen a 3D printer work before like I haven't, you'll find this process very interesting, I think. Uh, Mona Colburn, you, you've been, what, You've been an associate here for what, some 30 years? Yeah, over 30 and, years. And this is sort of like your playground in your home, right here, this right. wet lamp, this right? This is the fun room. <laughs> this yeah, is the, the preparation fun room. lamp. Yeah. And, and we're gonna talk about these later, but over your shoulder, right behind you, are many mm -hmm. examples of the way scientists, in, in the past, the only way they could create facsimiles of specimens yes. before the 3D yes. printer. But what I want to concentrate on right now are these 3D printers, because we got two of them going. Mm -hmm. So will you walk over with me and show me how sure. they're working? Okay. Um, this, this is kind of the, the newer spe the newer uh, style, I guess. Yes. And and what it's creating is a Tully monster. Yes, a Tully monster. What's a Tully it's, monster? It's a, it's a fossil uh, from the Pennsylvanian period, mm -hmm. some 300 million years ago, and it's our state fossil because we're the only state where it's. It's been the Illinois state fossil. Yes. No kidding. Yes, yeah, cool. Well, and why is it's, that? And it's Tully monstrum gregarium is the scientific. And, and name. why is it the Illinois state? It's, it's the only, we're the only state that it's been found in. Is that I right? I believe. Hmm. Unless, okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Um, what is it doing? Okay, it's, uh, we had um, a scan made of a, an original model that somebody made, and that was based off of a fossil. And the uh, scan is a, is a digital file. I received the digital file. It, you can see the model on the computer, and then the computer has software that will slice it into multiple layers. Uh-huh. Okay, so so, so. The, 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 actually the scanning process happens first, and once you get it scanned, then it creates a computer file, and which is then sent to you here. Yes. And you program this 3D printer mm -hmm. to, to make a duplicate of what's in the file. Correct. Fascinating. Okay, so this is the Tully monster in the making, and as we go through this program later on, we'll get to see this thing as it gets closer to being Correct. completed. Yes, right now it's building the support. It has to put a support under. Can I show that? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's actually let's show both of them. So, this would be the support right you're talking about. Right now it's laying down the support. Okay. And here's what it'll look like when it's finished and all the support comes off. Okay. All right. And it'll take about two hours to make mm -hmm. this size. Isn't that nifty? You know, I, I always wondered why they call them 3D printers, and until you see one work, you really don't get it. Yeah. But when you see one, it's just like laying down layers of ink, isn't it? Right. Now, let's let's show what it's laying down. Because okay. if we come back here, this is fed by a reel, and, and this is some kind of plastic. What, what's on this reel? Uh, it's called ABS plastic. Mm -hmm. It's. Uh, It'll go into a heated extruder. The extruder is over 400 degrees, mm -hmm. and it will melt the plastic. And then it will one inch of this plastic will become eight inches of very thin filament. And it's that thin filament then that's laid mm -hmm. down. When it's applied, it's still uh, warm and soft, so it mm -hmm. adheres. But then it cools real quickly. If you, if you touched that gray material right now, would it burn you? No. no. In fact, as soon as it comes out of the extruder, you can handle it, and it mm -hmm. won't burn you. Okay. Let's move over to this other one because this has got another job going and he's a little further along here. Mm -hmm. um, are, are you making this one just to demonstrate? Yes. It's nice and colorful and it, it's going to become uh, eventually a base, but okay. it'll be smaller. And it, it'll look like this? Mm -hmm. One of the nice things about 3D printing is you can scale it to, mm -hmm. it can go as large as your bed size will accommodate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and this little guy is working on, under the orders of the computer, which has a file in it, and it's telling it what to do. Exactly. Huh? Okay. Just like the other, just like the Tully Monster, except mm -hmm. it's a different program on this mm -hmm. one. And here's the, how thin, this is 1.75 millimeters, yeah. and this is just uh, about 
three. That's point what it lays down millimeters. at a time. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's after it gets heated yeah. and then lays down. A strip and and this that one's thick. laying layers that are 0.4 millimeters thick, mm -hmm. and the finest it can do is 0.1 millimeter. Fascinating. Okay, now what we have to do now is we have to go work backwards. We're seeing what the 3D printer can do, but we need to figure out how it got its orders to mm -hmm. make what it's making. And that happens in the scanning process. Correct. Okay, yeah. we're going to do that next. Okay. Well, Chris Whitka, we need to back up in this process just a little bit. But, you know, we're creating, we're creating the Tully monster in there, and the 3D printer is laying down the, the, uh, the, I guess, the standard for it or the base for it right now. Um, but that's later on in the process. You, as a paleontologist, have already taken the, uh, the, the actual raw material or the sample and scanned it to send that to them. Pa what does a paleontologist do, by the way? That's a long word. <laughs> we do a lot of different things. Uh, I, our primary goal is to understand the evolution of life on Earth. Uh, and, and so when we do that, um, we're often looking at different animals, trying to figure out their behaviors, trying to figure out uh, the evolution of, mm -hmm. of shape and size and, and things like that. Um, when it comes to things like Tully monsters, which are kind of um, ambiguous fossils. In, in other words, they, their relatives are not very obvious. Uh, and, and so they're a very good state fossil because we're the only place that they occur. Mm -hmm. They're also very, very distinctive. Um, and so scanning significant things like that mm -hmm. is part of what we're trying to do. Okay, let, let me ask you to do something for us. We've, we've got a model of the, of the Tully monsters. There are two of them sitting next to you on the table. And we also have uh, a picture of the Tully monster on your screen. So what the next process, part of the process, I guess, is to is to is to be able to scan the model, so that you create a file. Right. Right. Okay. So would you please do that for us? Show us how the scanner works. Sure. The uh, Tully monsters are kind of an interesting thing. Uh, they occur as flat fossils. In other words, they they are not three dimensional fossils, um, and and so we have to rely on artist reconstructions to actually understand what they might have looked like when in the round. Uh, this, is, this is a model that was created uh, a few years ago uh, that we're scanning right now. And you can see it's got two Tully monsters that are kind of mm -hmm. mounted on this rock. Um, and, uh, and so we're scanning the model to, to create this, this 3D file for oh, Mona. Oh, okay. Create. Now I'm seeing the red, the red lines on the Tully monster. Those are the scan lines, huh? Yes. Okay. What the scanner is doing is uh, it will take a, a couple of photos, but then the, the really n the nuts and bolts of the scanning occurs with these little lasers, which are coming out, mm -hmm. hitting the object, and then bouncing back to the instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, the instrument then kind of calculates the three-dimensional coordinates for that particular point. Mm -hmm. uh, this model has probably four to five million different points that it's calculating. Once wow. it's created that framework, yeah. then it overlies the, 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 the pictures, wow. and so it gives it that color. Okay, let, let's, let's talk about something. You said they're kind of difficult because they're flat, and you, and you have to rely on representations to get it. But that's not true of every fossil that you find or every no. bone or everything. Thank goodness. But, <laughs> no kidding. And Now, this guy, this, this cat is a very interesting specimen because they were rare, number one, right? right. And, and this is not the saber-toothed cat that we're all familiar with, but it's close, isn't it? This is one of its relatives. Uh, this is a, a, actually more rare in the Ice Age of North America. This is Homotherium serum. This is a scimitar cat. Mm -hmm. um, and this is some work that we were doing in 2008 in a cave in Minnesota. And uh, this, is, this is the first specimen of this species in kind of the Great Lakes area in the upper Midwest. Uh, the nearest, next nearest specimen is probably either uh, central South Dakota or uh, Tennessee. So they're very, mm -hmm. very widespread. Um, this one is about 30,000 years old. We were able to, to date it directly. Uh, so we radiocarbon dated it, and then we also were able to get DNA out of it. And, and this is the real, part of the real skull. Right. This yeah. is the real skull itself. This is, if to orient yourself, uh, this is the back of the skull. You're looking at its side right now, but this is the back of the skull. Uh, this is the area right above its, 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 its eye orbits. Mm -hmm. um, its mouth would have, would have articulated right here. Its jaw would have articulated oh, okay. right there. All right. So. Part of the problem was its jaw was gone, so you had no teeth, which made it difficult. Right. It? 
Right. When we first found it, this this is what we found, uh, and uh, and it doesn't have any teeth. Saber toothed cats are are called saber toothed cats for a reason. That's the most distinctive aspect mm -hmm. of their anatomy. We knew it was one of the saber toothed cats. We just didn't know it was this particular yeah. one until the uh, the geneticist called us up and said, "Well, could it potentially be this particular species?" Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, sure. This is and this is what the three D process ass assists you in doing. This is an exact representation of what you're holding, isn't it? Exactly. I mean, the dimensions are exactly the same. And you can see, if you, if you saw the way he was holding his, you see that all of the, uh, all of the uh, undulations and angles and size and everything are exactly the same. Yep. Although, you will notice, there's some, some, I some issues here, aren't there? Right. This was our first experiment in 3D printing. And uh, what we did was we CT scanned it, uh, and then we, we combined all those CT scan slices to get together to create the 3D model. Mm -hmm. And in this case, a couple of the slices didn't completely get integrated into mm -hmm. that model. And, uh, and, and so when we printed it out, that was, an, that was a blank. We had to fill it in. Mm -hmm. uh, since then, we've gotten better at it. Uh -huh. And speaking of better, look here. Now, here's the original, the real uh, lion's or the cat's front leg, right, I guess? Right. Or is that what you call his arm, I front, guess? Huh? Front arm. Front yeah. arm. And then here is what you're able to produce from the 3D printer. Yeah. And uh, not the soft material that we're going to see with the Tully Monster, but a more of a, like a plaster or stone right. composition. And those circles are where we took samples for DNA and our radiocarbon dates. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. OK, now if you would, let's go back over to the computer, because I want to see the finished product of the scan of this cat's head, if you can show us that. Sure. This is the this is the scan oh, of this cat's head. Sure. So you can see we're right now we're looking at that same side-on view. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to rotate it around. So you're looking at this saber-toothed cat in the face. Terrific. Um, you know we don't have any teeth down here, otherwise it'd be much scarier. Mm. <laughs> uh, so we keep turning it around. Um, part of the nice thing about this scan, we, since we CT scanned it, it, it actually scans all the interior voids and the interior structure of the bone too. And so these are its sinus cavities. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very complex wow. morphology. There's your 3D technology right there. And you right. know, 20 years ago, this was not possible. No, no. Wow. Well, Terry Martin, we, we've been watching this 3D process. It, it turns out that could really be useful for all kinds of science, archaeology included, couldn't it? Oh, yes, when, especially when we have uh, material like this that's fragile or things that might get broken from handling, or if we have things like these examples here we're going to look mm -hmm. at that are on loan from other museums, uh, then we, ha we have a permanent record of these that yeah. we can use. You, you've been working on a project recently about um, uh, animals, and, and wild animals in particular in, in the Midwestern area, and you, you found some, some, uh, some specimens that showed that the animal was injured, severely injured in some cases, was able to live, and then you, you see the difference between those specimens and the healthy specimen. Right. And it, 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 it begs the question, well, is it necessary to put animals down if they have a broken bone or something? Right. So the right. veterinary community is very interested in this. And oh, yes, and we have a uh, retired uh, veterinary a researcher who's working with us now, and uh, he's been noticing this with uh, archaeological bones. We mm -hmm. get some pathologies, uh, abnormal bones, and most of us uh, we're, we're busy identifying these things. But to to take it beyond, okay, there is an abnormality, but you know, go into the details of mm -hmm. that. We really don't have that the, the time or the expertise to go into that. Mm -hmm. But he does, and so this makes a nice collaboration yeah. with uh, with uh, Dennis Lawler with with both of. Uh, with us and with uh, Jeff Saunders and Chris Woodga on these uh, abnormal bones. Well, let's take a look at some sure. of these abnormal bones. First, we'll, we'll look at the, at the normal one. This is, this is a, a white-tailed deer. And what right. part of the anatomy is this? This is a radius, a lower front leg. Lower front leg, OK. And this would be right in this, this area here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's normal. We, this is the normal. And, and uh, in white-tailed deer, these don't uh, fuse together. These stay separate. That's what we've got mm -hmm. this taped together. Okay. But in uh, in a case here, we've got a, an example from a French colonial site from the 1800s or from the 1700s, 18th century, from Fort Saint Joseph in southwest Michigan, and uh, we've been identifying bones with uh, graduate students from that site to look at French colonial foodways, and we came across this specimen that's uh, you can see is quite oh different than the, than the typical. Yeah, I mean, we have no idea how long that animal may have been able to live. No. But 
but it was enough that to heal up the bone in, in, a, in a rather un, ungainly fashion, right? right? And generally, when you, you see something like this, you, you would think, well, if, a, if an animal got this kind of an injury, uh, predators like coyotes or dogs or, or yeah. black bears we'll or whatever that were, right that were uh, in, in the environment would take them down and that would be it. They wouldn't be yeah. able to survive. But when you find examples like this, all the remodeling that took place, and now with Dennis's help, we'll look into this and with x-rays and CT mm -hmm. scans to see if there's signs of infection and what the cause of the break was. And a lot of these we can't tell but uh, at least this gives us a chance to look at these unique specimens mm -hmm. this way. Yeah, let's move on down the line here. What are we looking at here? Okay, these are, this is a normal deer humerus again, mm -hmm. and here's a, an x-ray of a normal deer humerus, mm -hmm. uh, again from the upper front leg. And uh, this is from Fort Wiatnon, which is another French colonial site in the Wabash Valley where uh, mm -hmm. Lafayette, Indiana is. And these are examples from that site uh, of deer bones that, uh, did not fare so well mm -hmm. from injury. Mm -hmm. So this is a broken portion of, right. of this This is one. the distal yeah. end, and you can mm -hmm. see the, the oh, deformity on yeah. that. Yeah. But again, the animal lived long enough to heal. It so lived to heal some, some long way. enough to completely remodel. Now, whether it was wow. able to walk on these limbs or not, uh, we don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, And we've talked to hunters who have seen these, and, uh, and they say, well, gosh, I've seen deer getting by on three legs. And uh, mm -hmm. and so maybe this is this is what happens, you know, more often than what yeah. we think. And, and another example here. And too, another example is the, the, the same, the same occurs, radius, you know, and on yeah. this one, you can see the the lines, the way the bone would have been, and it and it healed that way. Mm -hmm. The remodeling mm -hmm. absorbed that whole yeah. broken area. Nature's remarkable, isn't it? Well, I it mean, is. the way it attempts to, to it try to get back to normal. And there again, and to think, yeah. you know, how how many weeks or months this deer would have been laying yeah. low, oh, God. and and probably nutritionally stressed, yeah. but uh, able to survive. Mm -hmm. And and uh, now, how long it took for um, the French and Indians to, uh, you know, see this guy and and where he ends up in the in the soup pot at mm -hmm. the Fort yeah. Wyatnon or Fort St. Joseph? That's another question. But right. at least it shows how resilient these animals are. Yeah, yeah. And it shows, uh, it shows people who own animals or who treat animals, maybe it's not necessary to put right. an animal down every right. time there's an and injury. And that's some of the, some of the talk in, in yeah. zoological institutions yeah. and everything is, uh, if it has a broken bone, uh, they wouldn't survive in the wild. But this is evidence that obviously mm -hmm. they, they do. Thank you, Terry. You're welcome. Zoology collections, my favorite. Meredith, what are you holding? <laughs> I am holding a, a research study skin of an armadillo um, prepared for, for um, people to take data from. They're in a sort of typical standardized pose. You find this in any research collection you, would you went to, um, and not just armadillos, all specimens, the mammal specimens are in this pose. Yeah. Um, but, but, you're, but the reason you're holding this is because we've recently found that very close to Springfield, there's been an armadillo specimen. Sure, yeah. so armadillos are, are creeping slowly northward and we know that they are moving northward in Illinois. Mm -hmm. And um, although uh, uh, specimens are found in a lot of different places in Illinois, we haven't found them in Morgan County until relatively recently. Mm -hmm. So we had someone bring in to us a specimen. Bring it out here. And this is what they brought into us. Oh, this is part of the tail. Huh? This is part of the tail. So this, mm -hmm. it's clearly an armadillo. There's nothing else. There's no other mammal that has this structure. Certainly not in mm -hmm. North America. Um, what you're seeing are the bony elements that are yeah. the, um, the the protective uh, armor that the armadillo has. Mm -hmm. This is sort of the base, closer to the body, and as you go out. Sort can of we look away. down through the center of that? Sure. Can you show us? Yeah. Sure. So you can see the the in the middle here are the vertebrae, mm -hmm. and they are surrounded by the the armor there. And the and tail is bone, isn't it? Well, it's it's bones surrounding the tissue, but mm -hmm. the tissue, since this was in the wild or out in nature, it dried as it was sort of out there in the in the in the elements, um, and so what we wind up with there's a little bit of dirt in there. But um, yeah. yes, the the surrounding um, protection is bone that forms within the skin, and then and then it yeah. surrounds it. This was found in Morgan County, which means that we're likely in the Springfield area going to be seeing more and more of these it's because they have been moving east and north, haven't they? They are moving eastward, yeah. they're moving northward, creeping yeah. sort of slowly um, but surely northward. So it's definitely possible um, that, they, that they are in our area yeah. as well. This was in southeast southeast of Jacksonville. There's, there's been a lot of talk recently because of these cameras that, that people set up at night and you can, you can see the critters that go mm -hmm. through the woods and across the prairie at night. 
night that in many cases we didn't know were there. It's true. And mm -hmm. we're getting sightings now of of mountain lions yes. and wolves. Yes, indeed. So that's, and actually an armadillo would be another kind of cool critter that, that you might find out there. Yeah. Isn't there? Because a lot of these critters are shy of people, um, and so that's actually a really excellent way to make yeah. observations in nature. Now, in mountain lions, in fact, you have a specimen here, has been, uh, have been found uh, in southern Illinois, haven't they? So, so this is, this skull here is a, from a, a mountain lion that was hit by a train in Randolph County mm -hmm. in 2000, um, and genetic it was a sequence um, for some genes to determine whether or not it was a wild animal or if it was an escaped captive animal and that conclusively showed that it was associated mm -hmm. with wild North American populations mm -hmm. um, in Randolph County. Mm -hmm. There have definitely been some records more recently, photos like you said, trail cams out in uh, western Illinois and northern yeah. Illinois as well. So this is another animal that as populations in the wild are improving and becoming more healthy, they're expanding their distribution back into formerly where they, mm -hmm. they did used to occur. Yeah, and we, we, we may be able to add him to all these other Illinois specimens here that, that one time or, or still uh, frequent Illinois. Mm -hmm. Well, the badger is definitely another good example actually of an animal that was way was down on way the left. Reduced. That yep. big one on the left. He yeah. Oh, so they like to live in the prairie and they're big burrowers, but that's mm -hmm. kind of the opposite of when you're using it for agriculture. They're 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 not actually really desirable. Yeah. Um, and as a lot, um, they have been making a comeback as well in central Illinois. Uh, as, yeah, to as, the chagrin of property owners. I'm sure I think. that is definitely true. Although some of the CRP lands and things like that, they are yeah. um, probably able to persist. Thank you, Meredith. Sure, you're welcome. Jonathan Raymond. I guess the biggest collection here at the Research and Collection Center is anthropology. Yes. And that's where you live, right? I'd like to. I have to be across the hall, but I'd like to live near. This is where the fun is, and this yeah. is where the specimens are. Oh, yeah, are. this is why one works in a museum. You get to play with the really good stuff. Yeah. You know, you got an interesting project going on over here, and, and, and mm -hmm. what I want to show first is, is this item here, which is sort of stored the old-fashioned way. Right, that's a necklace. A necklace. And then what you're doing, you and your, your colleagues are developing ways to store things more permanently so they won't be jarred or they won't be disturbed and they'll be forever in perfect condition, right? And that's exactly. what we're looking at. Right. Claire Martin builds these mounts mm -hmm. and then we put the items in and they are just held properly and people can look at them. Researchers can study them without mm -hmm. touching them. And if necessary, as I can show you with some beads, if they have to get closer, the mounts can be picked up without any problem. Well, let's go over and take a look at those. And I think these are the beads you're talking about. Yes. Right here. And if you look, I mean, there are th thousands and thousands of beads there, and she had to string all those. Yes, she? she did, you see. And we can get them out without touching a single bead. Wow. Which means no oils on them, nothing. Mm -hmm. And then they get put back right. in. So this was a collection of beads just probably in a jar or something, you right? Know, it was in an, an envelope, a, plastic, <laughs> uh, a safe plastic yeah. envelope, but that's, they still would yeah. touch each other. This way, they don't touch, yeah. uh, they don't move, and you yeah. can look at them. And, and all these items that we're seeing here were from for, were collected by Illinoisans. These were all yes. in, in the hands of Illinoisans, right? Thomas Condell collected all of these back from 1916 to about 1926. And, and we're talking about these beads over here, which are these, these necklaces, necklaces right here, yeah. okay? Yeah. And he was one of the people who was responsible for the founding of the Springfield Art Association. Oh, really? So we have a further connection mm -hmm. with Illinois in that regard. And these these music these are musical instruments yes. from where? Africa. From Africa. And they are, some people call them violins or string mm -hmm. pick instruments, yeah. but you have the string tight, you have it up against you, and you use either a bow mm -hmm. to produce a sound, or you can pick it against the, thre the frets, which are here. Right. And, uh, and of course, that string would be tightened up. But yes. Say, a bow could have been made of anything, probably right. was made of some sort of plant material. And these were given to us in the 1930s by an Illinois yeah. collector. And we saw a little bit of this earlier, but this is a remarkable piece of art here. Mm -hmm. This is a Native American flute, flute from, I guess, from the Arizona. Southwest. Uh -huh. And it's... Oh, that is beautiful. It is a... Well, I don't have another glove here, um, but it is, as you can see, a woodpecker. Mm -hmm. And this, is, this wood has been dyed, the head has been painted, turquoise has been inset, and you would play it here. Mm -hmm. And then because, again, we don't want it to move in the case or be affected by movement, 
Claire built a holder for it. And, and that foam material holds it right in place. Right. You're, I heard you're a talented guy. Would you play something for us on it? If I had another glove, I would. But <laughs> I, I mean, I can play it, but I also have a little hesitancy about doing on-camera performances. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You're welcome. <laughs> Well, this is where we started this program, and, and this is about two minutes to go until, until our sea monster is, uh, <laughs> our, uh, is it Tully's monster? Oh, Tully monster. Tully monster is almost, is almost completely sculpted here with the 3D, uh, with the 3D printer. And Eric Grimmett, as, as, as director of science um, at, at the Illinois State Museum, things change fast, don't they? I mean, things are coming along all the time. Things change fast at the museum. We have new things coming in. We're documenting changes in biodiversity as new, uh, well, we saw the mountain lion yeah, yeah. came in, we saw the armadillo, and of course we have huge collections here that document biodiversity in the past as, as well. And this is a research institution that's based on the collections that we have, where we try to tie together the botany, the zoology, the geology, yeah. and the uh, and the archaeology, anthropology of Illinois. And, and in fact, you're involved in a very fascinating international study now about ecosystems and climate change and what's going, what has gone on in our magnificent past, all these thousands of years. You, the Illinois State Museum, and Penn State University are heading this whole thing up, aren't you? That's correct. This is called the Neotoma Paleoecology Database. Mm -hmm. And, and it's a big international collaboration. There are nine U.S. institutions involved directly. We have about 25 international collaborators. And what we're doing is assembling fossil data for the last five million years and in a, in a very large database where we can, we're, we're assembling uh, plant information, pollen information, faunal mm -hmm. information, all kinds of other microorganisms, mollusks, basically you name it. Mm -hmm. at the object of being able to look at ecosystem change through time globally. Mm -hmm. And this hasn't been possible in the past because these have all been dis disparate databases or not even in yeah. databases. And it's all part of an effort also to ensure that data that are produced by scientific research projects funded by public money end up in a publicly accessible database. Yeah, yeah. Eric, thank you very much. And to your whole crew here. Yeah, well, yeah. thank you. <laughs> and to make all of that information accessible, like he said, to the public. Well, we've been at the Illinois State Museum uh, today looking at the old and the new, and this is as close as it gets, folks, to being uh, Illinois' natural history attic. With another Illinois story in Springfield, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.